Greetings to all. Uh, welcome to the Zoominar on Molecular Basis of Proteinopathies. Today, we have an exciting uh, talk um, on bugs, drugs, and cell systems by Professor Eric Brown from McMaster University. I also would like to welcome Giuseppe Malacini from McMaster, uh, who's going to host the seminar, introduce the speaker, and uh, moderate the Q&A. And I have my colleague, Kevin Wood, uh, for um, more in-depth discussion on the topic after the seminar. So, Giuseppe, it's all yours. Thank you, Rams. It's a great pleasure uh, to have the privilege to introduce my colleague, uh, uh, Eric Brown. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Guelph uh, with Janet Wood in 1992. And then he moved on uh, to a postdoc at Harvard Medical School with Chris Walsh, where he did pioneering studies on uh, bacterial cell wall biosynthesis. And then uh, after a stint uh, in the biotech industry in, uh, in uh, Boston, I believe, um, McMaster was lucky to be able to recruit him back to Canada, where he very quickly um, uh, raised uh, through the ranks and is now a distinguished uh, university professor at McMaster, which is a title reserved to uh, the top 2% uh, of our faculty here at McMaster. And he's in the biochemistry, biomedical science department, as well in the Institute for Infectious Disease Research. Um, over the years, Eric received several awards. I will just mention uh, a few. Uh, the Canadian Society of Molecular Bioscience Merck Frost Prize, the Killam Fellowship, which is a very uh, exclusive fellowship here in Canada, as well a Canada Research Chair in uh, Microbial Chemical Biology. Um, Eric's work uh, has been very, very impactful uh, both in terms of discovering fundamental mechanisms for bacterial biology, but also for discovering new uh, antibiotics. Uh, is highly cited. Uh, we, we often cite you, Eric, uh, in my lab. Uh, my students often um, say, oh, remember what Eric said, one hour in the lab can save you one month. Sorry, one, one hour in the library can save you one month in the lab or something along these lines. Um, uh, Eric did a very important work uh, also in terms of uh, uh, starting new programs uh, here at McMaster, was not only the chair of our department, but also started a new uh, undergraduate program called uh, uh, Biomedical Discovery and Commercialization. He was also a pioneer who started the Chemical Biology graduate program at McMaster when uh, chemical biology was a brand new uh, field of science. So he has been uh, breaking new ground, both in terms of science and uh, education organization. He sits in several advisory and uh, editorial boards, but without further ado, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Eric Brown. Thank Bugs, you. Bugs and cell systems. Thank you, Giuseppe, um, uh, for that kind introduction. And, and, and thank, uh, thank you, Rams, uh, for, uh, for the invitation to be here. Um, great, uh, great fun to be able to talk to you folks about the work that we're doing. Um, and uh, we'll kind of get into it here. Giuseppe mentioned that, that I was in uh, uh, Chris Walsh's lab um, in the early 90s. This is, so that means, all that means, I guess, is that I'm kind of old. Um, the, uh, this is a, 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 um, uh, the, the cover of time in September of, uh, of 1993. So I've been a postdoc in, in Chris's lab at this point for about a year. Uh, when this appears, I'm studying cell wall synthesis in bacteria. And, and as Giuseppe has suggested, I've, you know, I finished up a PhD working on, you know, proline metabolism in E. coli. And, uh, and um, I had no idea that, that um, you know, this was sort of brewing. This was kind of the first um, of the you know popular news weeklies featuring um, the, um, the the problem of uh, antimicrobial drug resistance, it's uh, you know it's everywhere in the news now. Of course, uh, what's kind of interesting is in 1993, uh, the issues uh, at the fore that were really you know principally around things like um, vancomycin resistant enterococci. Uh, methicillin resistant staph aureus, which of course continue to be a problem, um, but nobody ever had ever heard of 
Asnetter Balmanii and, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa was really, um, uh, you know, not a, um, uh, not recognized as a, as a sort of a huge clinical problem. Um, the gram negatives, which are, are currently where there's enormous uh, medical need, um, were, you know, were barely of mention. And, um, uh, you know, what's, what's perhaps a little bit disappointing, if not depressing, is that things are really far worse today um, than they were uh, in, uh, in 1993 when this, uh, when this appeared. Uh, and so, so why is that? I mean, here's, here's, you know, some more information, which is perhaps a little bit um, disappointing, if not depressing. Um, you know, we, we haven't really had a truly new antibiotic uh, in more than, than 30 years. Um, this is um, some lovely work uh, by the Pew uh, Foundation in the United States to kind of summarize um, uh, the status of thing. It's actually, it was, was this analysis was first done by Lynn Silver. What it does is it puts the, um, the number of new antibiotic classes discovered um, in the decade in which they were discovered. Um, here you have our cynicals discovered in the, um, in the early 1900s, uh, uh, penicillin in the 20s, and you have this golden age of antibiotic drug discovery kicked off by the work of folks like Selman Waxman, um, the discovery of streptomycin. And, um, you know, really a lot of, uh, of rich discovery happening. And then no new uh, antibiotics, um, truly new antibiotics um, discovered for the, uh, for the last three decades. This is kind of remarkable to me, I think in particular, you know, you've, you've just got a sense of my vintage. I'm growing up as a, you know, as a scientist during this period, you know, my training is through the eighties, early nineties. Uh, you have, you know, remarkable things that, that really have enabled um, uh, drug discovery in all therapeutic areas um, that are coming to the fore at this time. You know, recombinant DNA technology, of course, is, is, is a, uh, is an invention of the 1980s, as is things like um, uh, solid phase synthesis. Uh, so we have the ability, you know, in the early 90s to do things like express a recombinant protein uh, and, um, and interrogate it with large libraries of, uh, of synthetic chemicals, uh, you know, which becomes really the, the, um, the, the, the MO for, for drug discovery really for the last 30 years. Also during this time, right, you have um, genomics really, really um, coming of its own, uh, high throughput liquid handling and robotics, uh, structure-based drug design, uh, and remarkable perhaps, right, that, that this has been, you know, a, a nearly complete failure um, in the case of antibiotics, while it's been quite successful uh, in, uh, in other therapeutic areas. And so this is a, a problem, which is, is um, um, and a history that's kind of become an obsession for my research group. Um, you know, we, we're, we're students of history and have kind of taken note of really um, what has underpinned the success of the golden age of antibiotic drug discovery. Uh, and of course, uh, folks like Waxman were looking for, um, this is a Petri dish, of course, where uh, an antibiotic is, just, is spotted on a, on a little disc and, and, um, and a lawn of bacteria are allowed to grow and you see this zone of inhibition Folks like Waxman were interested, right, in compounds that would um, kill on a dish, uh, and if they could be made bioavailable and worked in a mouse, um, then they had a really good chance, frankly, uh, of working in a human. And this is a this is a paradigm which continues to this day. Uh, it is, um, uh, and it is in fact the, the the envy really of other therapeutic areas, uh, in that in that um, you know things working on a dish can translate into a mouse, which have some meaning in a human. Uh, the, um, uh, and yet, and yet the, uh, you know, we have, we have, we have a real paucity of success, uh, in this therapeutic area since. And so we've been asking things like, you know, this reductionist approach to drug discovery, which has really taken hold, uh, in recent decades, um, perhaps it's failed because there's something about this system, um, uh, which has been lost or perhaps underappreciated. Uh, and so we, um, you know, more than five years ago now, we really began um, to establish uh, methods in my laboratory uh, to, um, um, to use systems biology and, and, and such techniques to try to give us uh, what we hope are unique insights um, into, uh, into the system as a whole that can enable antibiotic drug discovery. There are really a wide variety of tools um, that are available. 
and I will talk about just two collections and our works with our work with them um, uh, during this uh, this lecture. Um, these um, uh, these collections are not new. I'm, both of them were you know invented uh, about fifteen years ago. The Keo collection out of the Nara Institute in Japan, Hirotada Mori, uh, and uh, and Barry Warner collaborating on this. This is a a collection of, of um, an ordered collection in which every gene that can be deleted in E. coli is deleted, uh, and the alone collection out of Uri Alone's laboratory in Israel, um, in which every gene expression unit, every promoter has been fused um, uh, with fast folding uh, green fluorescent protein uh, as a reporter. And there are many other um, collections that exist today and um, in pathogens and so on, ordered collections of deletions. And, uh, etc. But but these have been a, a real kind of um, focus for uh, for our systems biology efforts, uh, which we've done uh, principally in the um, in the model micro E. coli. And so, what are we talking about here? We're really talking about charting genetic interactions on a genome scale, um, principally the interaction of genes with other genes, of genes with chemicals, uh, and we are using formal uh, genetic principles to describe these interactions. Um, that are typically referred to as enhancement or suppression of some phenotype. And that phenotype is typically growth inhibition. We're thinking about things like antibiotics. And so here's just a look at that. We've got growth on the Y here. Um, we'll index wild type as having a growth of one. Delete gene X. Um, and we have maybe that strain growing with 70% um, of the growth rate of wild type. Delete gene Y, maybe it's 80%. Um, and then there's something called the multiplicative rule, which was really developed many, many years ago, popularized more recently by the yeast community when they were doing um, their um, genome scale genetic interaction studies. Um, but it predicts then that if we delete um, both of these genes together in a single strain, um, that the growth rate should go with the product uh, of these two, namely 0.56. And if, and if the resulting strain grows worse than that, we call that enhancement. Um, of growth inhibitory of phenotypes that are seen in the single deletions. And if it grows better, um, we call that suppression of the, um, of the growth uh, inhibitory phenotype. And so we can do uh, the same kind of thing with a chemical here. Uh, instead of deleting gene Y, we put um, some chemical uh, in, the, uh, in the well along with this strain that has a deletion in gene X. And here again, um, we we predict the interaction would be 0.56 um, if there is no interaction between this chemical and the gene. Uh, and if it grows worse than that, we call that enhancement. Uh, and sometimes this is called um, synthetic sick or, uh, or lethal, particularly if the lethal, of course, if the growth rate grows to nothing. Uh, and if it grows better um, than predicted, we are uh, uh, we're calling this uh, suppression of the growth inhibition phenotypes that we see here. And so I'll just begin now with our, our work um, with the KO collection. Again, this is a, um, an ordered collection of deletion strains in which every gene in E. coli can be deleted, has been deleted. And um, uh, a real key um, bit of, um, of technology in my group has is, is, is been the ability to pin at high density uh, colonies in an array uh, in which we can interrogate one clone at a time, one gene deletion strain at a time, uh, you know, what's going on in the presence of, uh, of a chemical or a double deletion. Uh, and this is the Singer rotor, which has really been the mainstay. Uh, our Singer rotor instrument, by the way, has gone back and forth along this rail um, at distances that are greater than the, um, the distance around the earth right now. Uh, we've done a fair bit of this. This is a 6,144 density array um, of the uh, e. coli gene deletion collection um, printed uh, on a slab of, uh, of LB auger that's about the size of a, uh, of a micro well plate. And so uh, enter Sean French, who was kind of did some of the early pioneering in my group on this. Um, uh, others have, have done this kind of work and, and Sean's mark was really um, to come up with a dynamic analysis in which um, his, his hypothesis is what that if we looked at this kinetically, um, we would have much greater sensitivity um, of, uh, of gathering um, uh, enhancement and suppression data. Uh, and he came up with a, um, uh, with a lovely platform and process uh, for doing this that begins with bioactive chemicals on the other end um, and a network assembly coming out of, that, out of that effort that I'll tell you about here. Uh, and so 
Uh, we can print, as I told you, or pr or print, pardon me, colonies on a, on a slab of LV auger. We can put a chemical in that slab um, and we can ask, you know, what the impact is of a deletion, say, on the growth rate um, compared to wild type E. coli. We do that by putting a plate um, in, a, in a transmissive scanner, um, shown uh, uh, eight of these in, a, in, a, in an incubator we have. Um, and we're now scanning through the plate um, and taking an image of, uh, of the growth of this plate uh, over time. And, and shown here is not a simulation, but, but one colony um, and, the, uh, and the integrated densities that we get uh, by scanning through using these transmissive scanners. So we're, we're, we're really taking an absorbance measurement right along the XY axis and then integrating um, uh, along, uh, along those, uh, those two axes. Uh, for um, uh, for every colony on the plate to generate uh, an, a, a volume for each colony, and so those integrated densities, it turned out, if we if we counted the colony forming units in a given colony, it turned out that those in integrated densities tracked um, perfectly with um, with colony forming units, and what that suggested was that we had um, in fact a, a perfect growth curve by 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 looking at these integrated densities. And so, uh, you know, here's a look at, at a plate. Uh, I think this is a 1536 plate where we have 1,536 colonies um, growing together on a plate. And we're looking at their, um, at the growth, the colony volumes, the integrated densities over time. Uh, <clears throat> and you can see here that um, there's quite a bit of spread out at the, uh, out at the end of this experiment, um, which is, you know, one of the things that plagues this particular area are things like edge effects, which can be, um, uh, normalized for, but, um, uh, you know, the different amount of inoculum that gets put down on the plate uh, and something that's independent of those sorts of issues, at least less dependent, particularly inoculum effects, um, is the doubling time of bacterium. So this is the, this is right, this is the, the, the first order rate, cor rate constant of doubling um, that we can extract from this part of the curve, but only if we have kinetic data. Um, typically what research has done is taken um, uh, uh, data at sort of endpoint um, uh, uh, densities out at the uh, at the end of such an experiment. So, so Sean's innovation allows for rate data um, and the collection of doubling times, um, which has really been a game changer in this. And so, shown here is a kind of a requisite hairball that you know we, we often see in systems biology talks, um, where we have the interaction here of fifteen different antibiotics and in various areas of, uh, of metabolism in bacteria uh, and, um, and their interactions with the dispensable genome uh, as, uh, as, as indexed through um, uh, suppression or enhancement data. And so uh, we can do that by either looking at colony size or endpoint interactions or with growth rate, growth rate um, there's about 20 million data points that went into the, the, um, the creation of this, uh, these chemical genetic interactions. And, um, and what we found was for, um, um, for a given chemical, um, we get about, uh, for endpoint data, we get about 100 um, uh, enhancers of the action of any one of these chemicals. Um, but using our, our, our growth rate interaction data, about 150. So uh, a pretty significant enhancement in our ability to detect uh, chemical genetic interactions uh, with this rate data. And so we've been mining uh, data sets like this um, uh, ever since to try to help us uh, in our work to understand how to, um, how to come up with uh, new approaches to antibiotic drug discovery. Um, and I, I just want to tell you kind of one example of that here. Uh, we are um, uh, very interested in the so-called gram-negative challenge, the gram-negative microbes. I mentioned Acinetobacter baumannii and Pseudomonas earlier. Um, these bugs are a, um, a particular challenge in the clinic. clinic. It's where the medical need um, is currently the highest. Uh, and um, of all the antibiotics that we have, virtually all of them work on gram-positive bacteria that have this very um, highly developed uh, cell wall, but a, a single um, a membrane in order for these antibiotics to, to enter the bacterium. Um, but relatively few of the available antibiotics are able to penetrate this um, two-membrane system of gram-negative bacteria, where you where you have this um, uh, outer membrane, this asymmetric uh, LPS and phospholipid bilayer, um, and uh, an inner membrane. You also have um, uh, efflux pump systems that are bound 
uh, and gram-negative bacteria. So it, these intrinsic barriers to, um, to entry and persistence of a drug inside of a, of a gram-negative bacterium, there are relatively um, few antibiotics which are active um, on this important, uh, this important class of bacteria. Uh, and this is kind of just a look at, you know, some of our favorites to think about. You have everything from the oxalazolidinones, which are really subject to, uh, to pumping uh, in a big way, to the, to the macrolides um, and other uh, antibiotics, which are, uh, you know, prevented for, from being um, uh, taken into bacteria uh, by structures uh, like, the, uh, like the outer membrane of those organisms. Uh, and yet we, we've been thinking about what, what, um, uh, what, what might be the possibilities if we could make uh, a gram-negative bacterium susceptible um, to gram-positive antibiotics, we would have, uh, clinicians would now have at their disposal um, a whole bunch of chemistry that is, um, that is otherwise not, not, um, uh, not, not used nearly so widely and not effective uh, otherwise on gram-negative bacteria. <clears throat> and so, Here's a look at this, um, this uh, enhancement experiment now where we're, we're looking at all of the genes in the E. coli um, deletion collection that leads to um, the enhancement of the activity of this gram-positive only antibiotic, rif rifampicin, um, and this one here, erythromycin. So, so some 138 uh, or, or so uh, uh, genes um, lead to the, uh, the enhancement of the activity of, of rifampicin. Uh, and, um, and 158 um, that, um, that enhance the activity of erythromycin. If we look at the, um, uh, an enrichment analysis, that is uh, the go term frequency counts um, in terms of what uh, aspects of physiology these genes uh, populate, they are um, for, this, for this little part of the Venn diagram are principally in areas like lipopolysaccharide biosynthesis. Um, similarly, those that are in, in this part of the diagram for erythromycin are in, in a similar area of metabolism. Lipopolysaccharide um, is, uh, is certainly dominant in terms of the, uh, the most significant enrichments. And if we look at the intersection of these two, we see some new pathways coming up in areas of, for example, insertion uh, of proteins into the outer membrane and outer membrane assembly of, uh, of gram-negative bacteria. These, uh, these enrichments point to to, to the following pathways that we know are um, critical to the biogenesis of the outer membrane uh, of gram-negative bacteria, that is, that has this um, asymmetric lipid bilayer of, uh, of lipopolysaccharide and phospholipid, um, uh, but also has important proteins embedded in this membrane. And it takes into account, of course, these pathways for the synthesis of lipopolysaccharide uh, and trafficking um, of those structures into the outer membrane also of proteins um, through the SecYEG system, uh, porin molecules, et cetera, that, that reside and, and have important functions in the outer membrane. Um, also lipoproteins that ultimately wind up many of them in the inner leaflet of the, uh, of the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria um, and those uh, systems which are important for the extrusion and trafficking of phospholipids which reside in the inner leaflet of the, uh, of the outer membrane. And so these are the targets, if you will, these processes, right, for, um, <clears throat> uh, for uh, compounds that would then uh, lead to the, um, the sensitization uh, of a gram-negative bacteria to, um, to otherwise gram-positive only uh, antibiotics. And so the I next idea was then, could we use this systems information to develop a screen for chemical compounds um, that targeted the outer membrane? And, um, we have a fair bit of experience in, in small molecule screening in my group. It's something that we've been doing for many, many years now. And we have our heads up for phenomena like this. This is John Stokes, um, who uh, was a PhD student in the lab. Um, he's since gone on to do a postdoc with um, Jim Collins at MIT. And I'm really delighted to say that John has actually joined us now as faculty. Um, he's an assistant professor now at McMaster um, as of July 1st. Um, John, uh, John's work here was... Um, uh, was, he was actually doing something completely other, but, but, but found this, um, this phenomenon and, and had, had really the, um, the foresight to understand how valuable it might be. He discovered that vancomycin was active against E. coli at low temperatures. Uh, and so, you know, here's the, the growth of E. coli versus a concentration of vancomycin. 
Um, this is this is at um, uh, 42 and 37 degrees. So under normal growth temperatures, it has an extremely high um, um, uh, concentration for growth inhibition. And so, you know, we don't associate vancomycin as being active on E. coli, but this is at 15 degrees, 20 degrees, 25, uh, 30, and so on. And so we see this unusual temperature dependence to the action of vancomycin. The next thing John did was ask, what would be the suppressors of the activity of vancomycin uh, at this cold temperature? And he looked at every one of the deletion mutants um, and looked for those that could grow um, at, um, at otherwise growth inhibits, right, concentrations of vancomycin in the cold. That, that list of suppressors was a very interesting list. It looked an awful lot like the list of genes that are involved in the synthesis of the outer membrane, particularly lipopolysaccharide synthesis. And so John recognized instantly that he had um, the makings of an antagonism screen. Um, that um, that um, uh, the brown lamb may be known for at this point. The idea was to screen for life. Um, and so we incubated E. coli um, at, uh, at 16 degrees in the presence of vancomycin um, for a very long time. E. coli grows very, very slowly uh, at 15 degrees. Um, and we would look for chemicals then that would lead to um, the suppression of growth inhibition of vancomycin. An outer membrane target list, idiosyncratic genetics, and what that meant was that there would be a very low frequency of actives that would come up with a screen like this. Um, few or, 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 or no nuisance compounds come up in a screen like this. Um, and it also has some increased sensitivity over, over looking for compounds that simply say enhance um, the activity of, a, of, a, uh, of an otherwise gram-positive only antibiotic. Um, could talk about that after, is there any questions? We, um, we first just screened a, a, a library of, uh, of known drugs um, and bioactive compounds um, and came up with this very interesting hit, um, this antifungal compound, pentamidine, um, which has been used to, uh, to treat um, uh, fungal infections, particularly lung infections um, in immunocompromised patients um, with these, these um, uh, named after the, 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 um, uh, the five methylene groups here that bridge these aromatic uh, amidine moieties. Uh, and so it turned out that pentamidine, in fact, did not inhibit one of the targets that I referred to er uh, earlier, um, but in fact, interacted directly um, in a physical manner with the outer membrane uh, of E. coli, leading to perturbation of this membrane um, and the entrance of, uh, of otherwise gram-positive only antibiotics into this gram-negative bacteria. Uh, and this was the key experiment of many, um, Tom Forks my microscopy. Um, we're dragging a probe now across um, the surface of E. coli. And what we see on a wild type E. coli that's not treated with a chemical is our undulations that are really on a nanometer um, um, uh, a scale. Um, in the presence of 25 micrograms per mil pentamidine, though, these very deep furrows uh, develop in the surface of the bacterium, consistent with the perturbation of membrane structure, allowing uh, um, gram positive drugs to enter. And you see these, um, this, you know, very huge uh, undulations in the, in the surface that are reminiscent of this, of this um, <clears throat> natural product peptide, uh, polymyxin B, um, which is known for and celebrated for its uh, interaction with the outer membrane of, uh, of gram negative bacteria. And so Craig McNair was uh, very interested to see whether or not um, he could make use of pentamidine in an animal model of infection. This is a checkerboard that um, uh, we, um, we do routinely in the group where we're looking now at the interaction of, of pentamidine um, with another uh, antibiotic, in this case, novobiosin, which is a gram-positive only antibiotic. Novobiosin having quite a, a high, so blue is growth and white is absence of growth. Novobiosin on its own, on its, on its own is not not good at inhibiting the growth of, uh, of this organism, um, and nor is pentamidine, but when we combine these together, we have this sweet spot of concentrations uh, where pentamidine and novobiosin are showing synergy. Uh, and so Greg did, um, uh, did experiments where he, he looked at um, both the survival uh, and, the, um, and the counts of, uh, of abomanii in, uh, in all organs. Uh, of the mice uh, infected with abomania and treated with this um, uh, with this combination and saw um, survival of all individuals, complete clearance um, shown here a spleen, but we saw the same 
um, results in all organisms, all organs, pardon me, that we looked at, um, the combination showing sterilization um, and either of these two compounds alone um, showing um, uh, little or no um, impact on the, uh, on the infection. So this, um, uh, this, this work really had us uh, convinced that, that we were on the right track with this screen. We've since uh, expanded this screening effort uh, on more than 100,000 diverse synthetic compounds. Um, and this work was just published by Christina Klobuchar, uh, a PhD student in my laboratory and former postdoc, JP Cote, um, where we have um, two uh, new compounds. These, these two are um, not inhibitors of an enzyme involved in the synthesis of the outer membrane, um, but rather are, uh, as you can kind of surmise here, are cationic amphiphilic compounds um, that are uh, disturbing the outer membrane. Um, of E. coli and other gram-negative bacteria. Um, these two put a premium on uh, looking for compounds that um, would be very selective in their perturbation of the outer membrane um, without interacting, for example, with the membranes of, uh, of, of, of human cells. And um, we have in these two compounds, pretty selective compounds for the, uh, for the outer membrane of gram-negatives. Okay. Turn our attention here to uh, chemical chemical interactions. The idea here, of course, is that we're going to combine uh, two chemicals, uh, and um, and I, I want to tell you about our work in nutrient biosynthesis, um, as it's been a kind of an unusual effort in using um, metabolites um, as the second chemical in order to suppress the action of the first chemical um, that might be an inhibitor of uh, of nutrient synthesis. Um, the concept is really the following: we I told you that you know, E. coli has lots of genes, that, that some uh, 4,000 of them or, or so are essential for growth, or are, are dispensable, pardon me, for growth on uh, uh, typical microbiological media. And those are, those are rich media conditions. So media like MHB and LB um, are rich in amino acids and other nutrients. Uh, and if we ask um, which genes are essential for the growth um, on, uh, on rich media, we come up with a list of uh, of 303. Uh, and if instead we ask uh, those bacteria to grow on a minimal media, a nutrient limited media um, containing, for example, say only glucose or ammonium chloride, and we're asking them to synthesize um, uh, all of the necessary metabolites that, uh, um, that often they can glean from, uh, from this rich media, um, we get about 119 uh, additional genes that are important for that. Those 119 genes are in very predictable areas of uh, metabolism. Um, uh, you know, almost two thirds of them are involved in amino acid biosynthesis. Um, another um, big collection are involved in purine uh, and pyrimidine synthesis, um, and still more are involved in vitamin um, and cofactor synthesis. And so we've been, you know, thinking about these aspects of metabolism of bacteria. Um, as perhaps druggable. In other words, that the, um, the areas of uh, uh, the sites of infection um, are, are sites that, uh, in some cases at least, may be under considerable nutrient stress, um, and, uh, and that some of these processes could be druggable um, from the perspective of, uh, of, of developing a new antibiotic. Um, and some of the early work in my group is done by Smiles Litney, who's a former PhD student, um, now a postdoc, uh, at, um, at Stanford, uh, Sumaya um, did a screen of 30,000 diverse, uh, diverse chemicals um, looking for growth inhibition, uh, uh, really in this nutrient limited condition where she would provide just glucose and ammonium chloride. Um, some 340 compounds did, had some ability that are shown in red here in a, in a, um, a 3D plot where we're looking at um, um, a triplicate assay some 340 led to some uh, significant growth inhibition. Uh, and she, she, by adding back um, uh, amino acids, nucleobases, and vitamins, um, determined that 71 of these then could be suppressed with the action um, by adding back these metabolites. Uh, and these were keepers for her. Um, these could be then subject to uh, systematic studies of metabolite suppression uh, in order to um, come up with hypotheses for the for the uh, mode of action uh, of such chemicals um, that could be at the very least be good probes uh, of metabolism and perhaps leads um, for, uh, for new antibiotics. 
and here's a look at her metabolite suppression array. So, so she would have uh, M9 is our nutrient restricted medium. Uh, M9 all is when we add back all nu uh, nutrients, amino acids, nucleobases, um, and vitamins, et cetera. She could add back just the amino acids, just the vitamins, just the nucleobases, um, or add back these things singly. Uh, and then, uh, you know, she went deep into the oxytrophy literature uh, for both yeast and bacteria, which is, which is more than 40 years old now, to come up with these very signature um, uh, 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 combinations and pools um, that, um, that are indicative uh, and very diagnostic of, um, of interruptions, particular pathways. And uh, this work was um, quite productive, uh, a screen of just 30,000 compounds, um, yielded two new probes of, uh, of vitamin synthesis. Um, the first is this, um, uh, this particular compound here that was uh, suppressed by paraminobenzoic acid uniquely. Um, and so that makes this a unique um, folic acid synthesis inhibitor. It inhibits the PABA, uh, the PABA enzymes. Um, it has um, uh, uh, an MIC of about two micrograms per mil in, um, in, uh, in E. coli and, and for... Um, uh, for these enzymes, PAB-ABC, we found a, a, um, a, an inhibition constant consistent with uh, slow binding and irreversible inhibition um, and inhibition of, of 7 micromolar. Uh, similar to this molecule over here, MAC13772 uh, was uh, suppressed uniquely by biotin. Um, it was uh, found to be an inhibitor of bioA synthesis, MIC of 4 micrograms per mil, IC50 um, uh, submicromolar. We've done quite a lot of SAR here, um, co-structure um, of this particular molecule. It actually um, tags the paradoxal phosphate cofactor at the active site of this enzyme um, to form a very tightly bound uh, adduct. Uh, and more recently, Lindsay Carefray and my lab and, and team have shown that this is efficacious uh, in an animal model of a Baumannii infection, um, where we're able to um, uh, mimic humic biotin, le biotin levels in a, uh, in a mouse. And so um, uh, this work has been um, uh, quite exciting for us. Uh, two two unique compounds that, um, at the very least, are new probes of uh, of, of the chemistry and, and metabolism of, uh, of vitamin synthesis in in bacteria. Um, but we um, we've been very interested to kind of take this work a little further. Uh, the uh, and our work in gene gene interactions, I think, is a nice example of this. So here we're now act looking at um, uh, two gene deletions, right, which are showing some meaningful interaction, um, suppression uh, or enhancement of a, uh, of a growth inhibitory effect of either a single deletion alone. Um, and um, we've made a, we made in this particular work with JP and, and Sean French, uh, a focus on um, some 80 or so genes um, involved in nutrient biosynthesis, again, taken from this area of vitamin, um, nucleobase or amino acid synthesis, uh, and these particular deletions, right, which are dispensable in rich microbiological media, uh, were then crossed with every one um, of the single uh, uh, gene deletions in the KO collection. Uh, marker over here being apromycin, the marker in, this, um, in, the, uh, in the KO collection is CAN, uh, and then these are crossed, mated um, to create a double deletion um, that's capable of growing in rich, rich microbiological media in both apromycin. Um, and canamycin. So these, uh, these guys made um, uh, about 160,000 uh, double deletions and, um, and characterized those um, for their growth on rich microbiological media. So we're looking at unique interactions between a nutrient biosynthetic gene deletion um, and, and, and a gene in the rest of the genome that lead to a, um, a, 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 um, an enhancement in growth inhibition. Uh, from, uh, from such interaction um, uh, due to that interaction. And so uh, again, another, another hairball here. Um, uh, there's, a, uh, there's about 23 interactions um, per gene on average of those 82 genes with the rest of the genome. Um, so it's a uh, remarkably dense um, and, uh, and complex um, network of interactions, which is not so dissimilar to what's been seen uh, in yeast. Um, you know, really speaking to the redundancy, um, the network-like uh, behavior of, uh, of physiology uh, in bacteria, um, as we have seen in yeast, 
uh, where, um, where these gener genetic interactions are really about resisting um, perturbations, right, in, um, in any of these, uh, these sensitive uh, metabolic processes. <clears throat> what was really telling and, and kind of nice for us to see is that um, uh, we saw completely lethal interactions um, where um, in, in many of the known processes of uh, biosynthesis and transport. Um, so uh, a bacterium when faced with nutrient limited conditions has really two options. And they can either synthesize a metabolite, which is important to them, or they can import that um, from, the, uh, from the environment. Um, and, um, and if both of those processes are, are um, uh, impaired, then, um, then we have a synthetic lethal uh, situation. And we were quite interested with our um, interest in, in the, in the biotin biosynthetic pathway uh, in the synthetic lethal interaction between the biotin transport order uh, biop um, and genes that were important in, um, in the synthesis of biotin, namely bio A, B, and D. And so <clears throat> this was very um, uh, useful to us. Um, Green, uh, Green Kumar was a, a PhD in the, uh, was a postdoctoral fellow, pardon me, in the laboratory at the time um, who, um, who led this work. Uh, and uh, Grima noted that, that our, our biotin inhibitor, right, 13772, um, was capable of significant new growth inhibition, right, of, of E. coli. Um, if she used in rich microbiological media, she used that um, compound in the presence of a transporter deletion. So that's the biotin transporter. So we knock out the biotin transporter. Um, this bug can't get biotin from the media and is sensitive now um, to this biotin inhibitor, um, whereas wild type, of course, is insensitive. Uh, Garima had been screening uh, natural product extracts from Jerry Wright's laboratory, looking for um, natural product inhibitors of biotin synthesis um, in, uh, in E. coli, um, but was frustrated by um, a, uh, a presence in those extracts of uh, contaminating biotin. Uh, and so um, this turned out, this phenotype then um, turned out to be something um, very quite useful to, um, to Garima's search. For, um, for biotin compounds. She screened a thousand extracts from Jerry's lab, uh, again, looking for growth inhibition um, on rich microbiological media um, in a, uh, a transporter deletion. Um, and remarkably, 22 of the thousand extracts lit up um, as, um, as being um, a growth inhibitory. More remarkable than that is that 10 of them um, were, had, um, <clears throat> um, had their activity uh, also exist, uh, just 10 of them were active also on wild type E. coli. So there were, there were a dozen uh, antibiotin extracts um, in, this, uh, in this 1,000. Uh, Grima went on to, uh, to isolate um, um, from, from having characterized at least one of those um, uh, and shown that this too is probably what's going on in the others, um, uh, these two compounds, which are known uh, as the amyclenomycins. Uh, uh, first discovered in, in 74 um, in Japan. Um, they have this uh, unique, uh, unusual amino acid that has this uh, cyclohexadiene uh, uh, moiety here um, with, a, with, a, with an amine, which is activated like our hydrazine in 13772 for attack uh, of the pyridoxal cofactor in the active site of BioA. Um, and so these are now two more, um, you know, very useful probes, and we are we're moving forward um, with the amyclinomycins as well as 13772 um, as leads for uh, for a little program in my group um, to develop uh, antibiotic compounds. And so, um, just to kind of finish this nutrient stress vignette off, um, I wanted to talk about how I think that these targets really mitigate innovation risk. And so what am I talking about here? Um, this is, um, uh, you know, a, a, a Venn diagram to try to illustrate um, a conversation that's kind of ongoing, I think, between um, the, the, the drug discoverers and the sort of pharma and biotech world and, and those in, uh, you know, among microbiologists and pathogenesis in the microbiology world. Um, where, you know, folks like myself, um, pointy-headed academics often refer um, to these, uh, to this class of targets, right, which are which are um, important for growth in vivo. Um, uh, drug discoveries in the pharmaceutical realm have been really focused on that 303 
um, set of genes, right, that are that are important for growth on nutrient rich media. Um, things like cell wall synthesis, protein synthesis, um, DNA synthesis, right, are are um, are in this category, category one, um, which are of course are important in vivo, um, but you would have much more sort of subtle processes um, involved in the pathogenesis of a bacterium. Uh, drug discoverers say that there's high innovation risk for this other set, um, even though it has great novelty. Um, often we we don't have in vitro systems to try to understand their activity. They often hit complicated targets that are difficult to drug. Um, and, um, and there's a, you know, a lack of things like simplest MIC testing um, that are available to, um, to many of the targets in this part of the Venn diagram. On the other hand, this area of nutrient stress, right, will have um, certainly have targets perhaps that lie outside those that are important for growth in vivo, um, but some of them will be important also. And, and, and I would suggest that that those uh, targets, which are, are important for growth in vivo, um, are uh, of intermediate innovation risk. Right? They, um, we, can, we can develop uh, in vitro systems to look at the activity of antibiotics uh, on a dish um, where we're asking for, for bacteria to grow in nutrient limited conditions. Um, we've done things like streptavidin to, to, uh, to nutrient rich media um, in order to look at the action of our biotin inhibitors. Um, this class of targets is also interesting. They tend to be um, small um, cytoplasmic uh, and very druggable targets uh, from the perspective of the ability to be able to do things like structure-based drug design. Um, and so we think the, um, the innovation risk is lower um, for this set of targets. Okay, I'll finish off here then with um, work that we've done in my group um, using this um, uh, collection, the ALONE collection, Yuri loans um, construction of some 2,000 strains or so in which fast-folding GFP has been fused um, with, uh, with virtually every promoter unit um, in E. coli as a way to uh, report uh, on, uh, on gene expression. So we can pin as we do, uh, this is a 6,144 density array um, of those 2,000 or so clones. So each one is in there at least in triplicate. And um, and we get, um, uh, you know, we can get a, a, a lovely plate that that we can see the um, the fluorescence of these of these particular grow, uh, clones um, uh, grown on solid media, presenting an opportunity to do things like put put any chemical that we would like in this plate um, to look at, you know, what is the unique and signature response um, of uh, of every promoter uh, in E. coli to a chemical. The problem was there was no um, equipment that was capable of imaging this array. Uh, and so we built it. Uh, enter, enter Sean French and, and a look at what he calls the printed fluorescence imaging box, the PFI box, has a Raspberry Pi computer and a, uh, a CMOS type camera. Um, and in this, in this, this um, dark environment of this black box, of course, um, is an LED array to illuminate the, um, um, the, the, these fluorescent colonies. Um, there's a plate um, sitting in the bottom of this, uh, of this device on the LED array. Um, these are uh, uh, 3D printed. Um, we, um, we now have several 3D printers in my lab. Um, the first prototypes uh, of this particular thing were in fact um, uh, done in a styrofoam box before, uh, before Sean um, got the 3D printer. Uh, all of this is open source um, and uh, you know, any, any kid um, can now build um, one of these boxes um, uh, working in uh, uh, you know, her parents' garage. Uh, here's a look at Sean assembling uh, one of these boxes. Very simple, straightforward. Um, uh, they are cheap um, and amenable to uh, paralyzation. About 200 US dollars um, to build one of these boxes. And so we have, we've built many of them and we're in the process right now of, um, of uh, looking at all the antibiotics that we can possibly get our hands on um, to characterize their interactions in a kinetic manner um, with, the, um, with the promoter library. And so here's a look, um, not at a kinetic experiment, but an endpoint uh, experiment where Sean is um, looking at the signature expression of uh, a wide variety of antibiotics. Um, and here's a linear discriminant analysis of the um, of, uh, of this data set where you could, you could take the first three that explain quite a lot of the variance um, in the data here. 
um, and doing a supervised classification, um, Sean sees something you know really quite impressive. I think that that he's able to really distinguish quite nicely between compounds targeting cell wall, those targeting protein translation, um, nutrient stress, membrane synthesis, or um, uh, membrane active, pardon me, compounds, folate synthesis, et cetera. And so this has given us great confidence that, um, uh, and this is a collection of about 200 molecules or so, this has given us some confidence then um, to kind of move ahead with a kinetic analysis of the system that's necessitated a deep learning approach where we're essentially watching a movie of the response um, of this array um, to uh, any compound. Um, and so we're building a training set um, and developing a deep learning model um, with which we can measure novel compounds now um, for their similarity to anything in our training set to make, to make uh, mechanistic predictions um, for, these, uh, for these compounds. And so I'll just I'll end with a quote. I, I, some of my time in, in Boston, uh, Giuseppe mentioned at the top that I was in Chris Walsh's lab. I, I spent about, um, about half my time, in fact, in Boston um, in the Coulter Laboratory, which was a, uh, an environment that had an ongoing uh, collaboration, in fact, kind of an exchange program with, uh, with the Walsh lab. Roberto got to be a, a fantastic friend and, and, and mentor. Um, and um, uh, and he's, he's just has a remarkably um, um, a pithy sense of humor. Um, when asked one day, uh, not so long ago, if, if I couldn't uh, have been a scientist, his response was I would have been uh, a systems biologist. Um, uh, notwithstanding Roberto's, Roberto's comment, I, you know, I think we've really um, enjoyed our, our efforts here. And I think we are indeed um, making some headway with these approaches that we, um, that we couldn't otherwise with the without systems biology. Um, I work with a fantastic uh, group uh, at young people, uh, of young people here. Um, and um, this is a, a collection of, um, of funders uh, and folks that I have, uh, have consulted for. So it's both acknowledgement and disclosure. Uh, I think I mentioned most of the um, important trainees, but it's a, it's a relatively long list that I, I kind of won't go through as I've already highlighted, I think some of the some of the leaders and, and major players. Um, uh, but I would like to thank the, the collaborators here. Brian Coombs, uh, McMaster, his, uh, he and his team have really taught us everything that we know about um, uh, studies of animal efficacy. Um, Deb Hung uh, at the Broad we've worked with um, in some optimization of the, uh, of the pentamidine molecule that was a CARBEX funded project. Uh, Hirotada Mori, um, for the um, for the, um, uh, the 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 KO collection, um, and um, and here I thought in fact did some of the very um, first work in um, in uh, coming up with ways to read um, those arrays in a kinetic mode. Chris Whitfield, um, an expert in polysaccharide synthesis at the University of Guelph, um, and Jerry Wright, my longtime colleague and collaborator at Master, um, who's uh, taught us everything we know about um, um, natural product. Uh, drug discovery. Uh, so uh, thank you as well for, you know, for your uh, attention and, uh, and interest. And I, and I look forward to answering any questions of you may. Thank you, Eric, for this fantastic talk. Uh, and despite the complexity of the topic, I'm always impressed by the clarity and uh, simplicity of uh, the presentation. I invite uh, attendees to post their questions uh, in the Q&A box. Um, and the, the panelists can ask uh, uh, directly. In the meantime, um, I wanted to ask you a question myself. Um, so it looks like a winning strategy is to combine uh, different drugs, uh, for example, the pentamidine and uh, novel biosin is an example. Um, but that also uh, creates a new level of complexity because if you have to screen uh, combinatorial libraries, then it's already screening a, a library for a single compound is difficult enough. But so how are you planning to deal with this uh, combinatorial explosion and uh, will deep learning, uh, uh, to which you alluded towards the end, help in this respect? 
Yeah, it's a really, really, um, really great question, Giuseppe. We've we've kind of dabbled in this area of chemical combinations for for many years now. Um, and at some point, we actually had a project where we were doing things like you know pooling to try to solve this problem. Uh, it turned out you know to be a little too noisy. Uh, but you're absolutely right. You know, once you think about, you know, just combining a library, you know, systematic combinations of a library of a thousand members, you know, you get into just enormous numbers super quickly. Um, so it's really not practical to do things in that fashion. And so that's kind of, you know, why we think, why we got so excited, frankly, about this idea, you know, to, um, you know, kind of use the, the systems approach to get a sense of, if we wanted to make a gram positive antibiotic active on a gram negative, what would be the target list? Um, and could we come up with an assay that would encompass that target list? And so, you know, once we had an assay like that, we thought now we had a kind of a road in to a wide variety of combinations. So we could now, you know, we could screen with an assay like that and come up with a short list now of compounds to systematically combine, say, with our favorite gram positive only antibiotics. Um, kind of what I didn't have time to talk to too much about today is that it's interesting that that assay, um, you know, uh, you know, returned a, a bunch of different compounds, and and not all of them, frankly, are um, uh, you know working with all of our gram positive only antibiotics. We see some kind of unique synergies um, of some of those compounds with some of those antibiotics, and we see. Uh, you know, that some of those compounds work on some of our gram negative pathogens. So, you know, we often will go from E. coli into a, you know, a, a kind of a wider list of, um, of uh, pathogenic bacteria of the gram negative ilk. And um, yeah, so there, there's, you know, and that's another thing that, that, you know, kind of we didn't add to, right? When we said we're going to investigate all these combinations, but what about all the different bugs um, as well? So, so, you know, where there's likely to be, you know, of any given combination, there's, we've observed, you know, there can be selectivity for a particular bug. So I, I think that that's a long way of answering your question, but, but I think in short, it's, I think it's about trying to find a clever assay, I think, um, that takes us into this without, without making that necessary, without, without making it necessary to really interrogate all of combination space, which is just about impossible without AI, that is. <clears throat> Thank you, Eric. Uh, we have several questions uh, coming up. Uh, I'll ask, I'll start from the question that is perhaps most relevant to what you just explained. Uh, have you considered using pairwise approximations to higher order interactions to identify candidates for? higher order combos? And this is a question from Kevin Wood at the University of Michigan. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think I know where Kevin's going with this. So, so you know, it, it is, I mentioned that we had worked a fair bit with trying to create, so we can, we can, we can reduce the, the size of the haystack in combinations by doing things like pooling compounds. Uh, and, um, we, we really tried hard to make that work. Um, in fact, I was contacted by a, um, you know, a guy who ran a computational lab and said, you know, I, I've got the secret to this. You, you know, I can give you the algorithm to, to do these setups. And, and we worked quite hard at this. This is, um, and, and never got to something that, that we felt, you know, comfortable with. I guess it's a negative result that maybe we should have published who <laughs> we had, but, but um, you know, our experience in chemical screening is that it's hard enough to come up with an assay with a single compound, um, right, in order to get a really good signal, um, let alone look at pools of compounds. And often that can, that can create a lot of noise that, um, you know, that makes life difficult. And so I, that, again, is, is probably the, the, the short answer to, you know, what is, a, what is a kind of a complicated thing to get into. Thank you, Eric. Another question from Kevin Wood. Beautiful work and experiments. Is it possible to extend these kinetic assays to evolutionary time scales by somehow, for example, reseeding a plate from colonies on a previous plate? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you, you can do things. So for example, if you wanted to know maybe whether a particular genetic background, a single gene deletion. Okay. 
was important um, ultimately for, um, uh, you, you know, might have a propensity say, to develop resistance compared to another. Um, you know, you could put that chemical on a plate and you could keep pinning and now you could look at every single deletion um, in time. The, the, the pinning thing is, you know, really it's going to pick up whatever's there um, and whatever's grown is going to be there more than anything else. Um, yeah, it's a really, I mean, it's really quite powerful to do this, you know, with a strain in which you have completely saturated the strain with, uh, with mutants. Now, things like resistance, I think um, you don't even need to do that. You could do that in pools as well, right? So um, it's not something maybe that you necessarily need to do with, um, uh, with, a, um, uh, with an ordered collection, but, but at the very least, I guess it's nice to have, a, you know, a barcoded collection to do something like that. But these are, um, yeah, I, I think these collections are, are, are super useful, whether it's a, a random transposon collection, which is, you know, barcoded that you can, you can have a look at, um, at what's coming out of the pool. Um, uh, very useful for suppression experiments. Enhancement experiments, it's usually something that you want to do, um, you know, by looking at an array of clones and kind of following what's going on with, um, uh, with, with, um, you know, with every painting, the time scale over growth, if that's what we want to look at is, you know, we're, we're um, I mean, if, you know, for standard temperatures, you know, we, things usually done in a day, um, you know, our, our, our 15 degree thing, I think our incubation was for 96 hours or something. So yeah, with time and temperature and so on, I mean, those are kind of the time scales you're looking at, but, but I think repainting is a way to really, you know, really look at this in, a, in an interesting way. Cool, thanks, that's really nice. Thank you, Eric. Uh, if you still have time, we, we have a couple more questions. One sure. uh, from Hebapala Mohammed. Thank you for the talk, Dr. Brown. Can the key structural elements of the two drugs be combined in one single compound? Would that elicit the same effect of using a combination of two drugs? Yeah, it's a really interesting idea, right? And um, you know, um, we've not done any such thing yet with any of our of our agents that um, that we uh, that we've that we've come out with, for example, that are targeting the outer membrane. Um, but um, you know, polymyxin comes to mind, right? As this this amazing compound that has um, this cationic peptide portion uh, that we know, um, and, and without the, the it also has this you know lipid like aliphatic tail. Um, and we know the peptide portion is really quite good at perturbing the outer membrane. Um, and that without the lipid tail, um, it doesn't do the second function of, of polymyxin, namely um, disturb the inner membrane of gram-negative bacteria. So in polymyxin, you have a great example of a molecule, which is bifunctional, um, a molecule that can perturb the outer membrane and facilitate its own uptake um, into where it can now penetrate the periplasm in the inner membrane of a gram-negative bacterium to carry out um, its a growth inhibitory effect, which is on the inner membrane uh, of gram-negative. So yeah, really, the, the nature's done it, um, but not us, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, talking about membrane disruption, we have uh, one more question actually from Rams. He's asking, if disruption of outer membrane is a major factor, can membrane disrupting agents such as antimicrobial peptides be used to enhance the potency of antibiotic compounds? Yes, absolutely. And I think I think what's key, the key thing, Rams, is to make sure that that um, and this is the hard part, right? Is to come up with something which is selective for the outer membrane, right, over host membranes. And we know that cationic peptides in general, right, have these sort of you know, inherent um, uh, liabilities in terms of the polycationic character. Um, and, um, but I, I, the outer membrane of a gram-negative bacterium is so much different, right? Physical, you know, in its sort of its, its physical chemical characteristics from, from host membranes, this has just got to be doable. So in, in just to continue on that, uh, if membrane disruption is the key mechanism, what about the outer membrane proteins, the pumps and so on? So do they have any role or do they have any, do you have any receptor proteins that you can target? Or are these compounds are going to be- Yeah, good question. Activity? Yeah, very good question. So 
it, I mean, it, it's so much harder to determine, you know, the really sort of, you know, uh, uh, and Giuseppe and I've had some of these conversations, right, about how, how do you figure out exactly how a membrane active compound is working? It's a huge challenge, right, compared to, um, you know, trying to look at the interaction of a small molecule with a protein target. Um, but, but today, Rams, we've not, we've not come up with anything that we think um, is interacting with a specific, say, outer membrane protein target. Um, uh, and um, virtually everything that we've, we've come up with today, we think is interacting um, dominantly with, um, you know, with the outer membrane structures, the, the um, particularly the lipopolysaccharide structures. We typically, I mean, one of the signature physical chemical characteristics right, is something which is amphiphilic and cationic, um, that outer membrane is very, um, you know, has anionic character, right, as well as, as um, you know, lipid character. Um, and so all of the compounds that we've come up with to date have, have you know, have characteristics that you, you could imagine interacting both the anionic and, and lipid character of the outer membrane. And again, I think, the, and that's fine, I think, the key is, you know, is making sure that it doesn't, it's not something that, that um, if your goal is a drug, it's not something that disturbs also the, um, um, you know, the canonical phospholipid membrane of the host. Right. So can we assume that these work for, uh, these are good for any, any gram negative bacteria then? Uh, no, yeah, I mean, I think it's doable. And I think, you know, we have some evidence too that this is actually going on in the host, right? So. Um, you know, that these cationic peptides and, and the innate immune elements of the host are working on the outer membrane and they're, they're um, you know, they're doing that in order to, in order to take on that bug, probably with, you know, some combination strategies that maybe we don't even quite appreciate yet. Great, great talk. Thank you very much, Eric. This was uh, fantastic. Please join me thanking Eric again uh, for joining us. And thank you to the attendees as well. Thank you very much, Eric. It's a lovely talk. I really enjoyed it very much. My pleasure. Thank you. So uh, you are only simply worried about the gram-negative bacteria. What about gram-positive bacteria? Yeah, we've done a fair bit of fair bit of work in gram positives. Our no? our okay. um our you know our work our work in that area is is um has largely been on you know, kind of new aspects of physiology that we, you know, we thought we could, we could target certainly our work in nutrient synthesis. Um, those compounds, you know, work quite well um, in, um, in gram positives, um, at least, at least most gram positives. Uh, the, um, we worked for many years on, on wall takeoic acid synthesis in staph aureus and the, 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 um, the, that's kind of where we got fascinated with antagonism screens and, and kind of complex genetics. It turned out that, that um, um, some of the compounds that we were able to pull out and, and, and others, in fact, um, Suzanne Walker's group at, at, at Harvard Medical School done some work in this area, as well as, um, you know, Merck really took advantage of the complex genetics that we mapped um, to do some very, very um, large scale screens kind of, of their entire chemical file. Um, and those, um, those compounds turned out to be pretty interesting. Many of them, the 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 one of the I think the most important interactions that we mapped was um, inhibition of wall takeaway acid synthesis leads to sensitivity to um, uh, beta lactam antibiotics in in organisms like methicillin resistant Staph aureus. So um, yet another combination strategy, um, right? Of trying to you know trying to make um, uh, you know drug resistant organisms sensitive to um, to, uh, to existing classes of antibiotics. Okay, thank you very much, Eric, and thanks, uh, Josephine, and more time. My pleasure.